For today's uh, scripture passage, I just wanted you to turn with me in your Bible, if you're able, and uh, we're going to have it on the screen as well. Luke chapter 23. We're going to be reading really about uh, the suffering of Jesus. It's from Luke chapter 23, verses 27 to 43. And I'm going to ask you to follow with me in your Bibles. In your Bibles, Luke chapter 23, verses 27 to 43. Would you read that with me? A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus, Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, are also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they were crucified with him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are just punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in the paradise. You bow your heads with me. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, this is a hard word to read because we remember your suffering, Lord. Lord. We remember that you died for us and for our sins, Lord God. And, and you died for, our, for us to have life and life in you. We ask you for your blessing today that your word will be broken to us and given to us. That we may be nourished in our spirits, in our lives. And we serve you with all of our hearts, with new vigor, with new strength, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Compassion is something that's hard to find sometimes in the city. Sometimes we find people lying on the street and we walk right by them. We don't really think much about it. I think when people come in from the outside of the city and they see someone lying on the street, they may feel compassion for them, they may feel sorry for them, but oftentimes we who live here, we're used to that, and we kind of walk by that, don't think much about it. Compassion is not all that common to us, and even outside, when things become familiar in the suburbs or in the country or wherever people may live, when they're familiar with things, people lose that sense of compassion, and it's the same thing for us, for all of us, but we live in a society that tells us that crying is that even at a death I've seen where people said where people will say be strong be strong and what they mean by that is don't cry don't let anything out just keep it to yourself but uh, these cliches that we say in our world today like real men don't cry how about don't give me a sob story I remember doing that at a time when somebody was telling me something a long time back when I was, you know, in my late teens and saying, you know, why don't you cry me a river, you know? I remember doing that kind of thing. But those cliches happen in our lives, in our world, because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to feel sorry for somebody else. We don't want to feel empathy, really, for somebody else, because we don't want to hear the pain. We want to hear fun things, happy things in our lives. Paul tells us, however, in the Bible, to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn in Romans chapter 12. It is okay, it's good 
And it's right to open our hearts to other people. Would you agree with me? Jesus opened his heart to us. The church, God's people at some point opened their hearts to us. But we do much better in our society to complain. In our lives, oftentimes, we do that even as Christians. But compassion is what Jesus showed when he saw the people who were suffering. He even felt compassion when he saw, if you remember, the, the folks walking around to the marketplace or they were walking around to the synagogues and places of worship. He felt compassion for them. And he said, he said they're like sheep without a shepherd. And he felt compassion for them. He felt empathy for their situation, for their state. And we as people, we have compassion for people that we care about. You and I care about, like I have my kids here, my cousin here. Uh, we feel compassion for those people. They're related to us. We may feel compassion for our friends, people that I know. I know Maria for several years. I may feel compassion for her if she's not feeling well. Verse 27, it says, Jesus, I'm sorry, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Our weeping in our lives is usually like these women that were weeping when they watched Jesus suffer. We do the same thing. We cry foul when something has gone wrong. I played ping pong with my second son, Andrew, yesterday, and I was beating him, okay? And as I was beating him, each point that I scored, he got more and more angry, okay? And he started tearing up. And then I just didn't let him go. And I just kept scoring points on him just to kind of get his reaction. But he kept doing it. And he got angry and he wanted to quit, walk away, and finally came back and finished the game. But, but, but we have compassion on those we love, usually ourselves, first, right? These women were watching Jesus suffer and they felt sorry for him because they cared about him. They knew about who he was and what he was trying to do in this world. We cry foul. We get upset when our family is offended. If somebody curses out my brother, I would get offended. You would do the same thing probably. We get emotional about crimes being done to people in our family or maybe our neighborhood or maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's a Christian around on the other side of the world and we hear something happens to a Christian, we get a little offended. We complain because our rights are infringed on. We like to pout. We like to blame people that don't look like us. Those people don't dress like me, so I'm going to blame them. Self-pity, false tears exist. And that's not what God is drawn to. The people of Israel were also feeling sorry for themselves. And it was valid. They were oppressed by the Romans. They were having to pay taxes, huge amounts of taxes for the Roman emperor. They were being harassed by them. They were sometimes being killed by them. And so they wanted to fight back. They wanted to get freedom for their country, for their, for their people group. But Jesus didn't feel sorry for them. Jesus was not there for that reason. Jesus was there for something more than that. See, I'm not saying we don't need personal freedoms. I'm not saying that. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, I wouldn't have been preaching here. I want you to talk, I want you to know that. I would not have been sitting in the front of a bus. So I'm not saying that we don't need our personal freedoms. But when it comes to the world, which God loves so much, we don't give their dying souls a second thought. We don't care if they're damned. We need, as people of God, to be concerned about our human rights, our freedoms, but not while ignoring those who are dying in sin. We can't ignore the people and just forget about them. I don't want to think about them. I don't care. If they're going to live that way, I don't want to think about them. If they're drunk, I found a bottle of beer on the windshield of my car this morning. <laughs> I have to be concerned about the people. That are, being, that are dying in their sin. We have to be concerned about that. Imagine a doctor 
that works in a hospital, and he would only care for people from his family. Imagine that. You walk to the hospital, or you go to see your doctor, and he says, sorry, I can't see you. Your last name is not my last name. God wants us to be his instruments of deliverance, sure, for our families, but not just for our friends and relatives and people like that, but for everyone, even for the people we don't know very well. He wants us to open our eyes. So number two, Jesus wants us to see the bigger picture. Verse 28, look at that with me. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Think about the future generation. Jesus is telling those crying for him to even be more concerned about the fate that awaits their city than even about the sufferings that he's going through right there. Don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. The physical destruction and the eternal damnation of those who rejected Jesus was more of a worry for Jesus than his own physical persecution, than his own suffering that he was going through right then. He was being whipped and he was being, you know, thrown around and, and punched around. But he was more concerned about the people that were going to die in their sin and their eternal fate. So Jesus was concerned about the people. Read verses 29 to 31 with me. It says, For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. And they will say to the mountains, Fall on us. Hard to read, right? And the hills to cover us. We haven't seen that kind of destruction here. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is green, when it is dry? Forty years or so after Jesus said these words, destruction came on Jerusalem on that city that they were in. It was destroyed by an emperor. Well, he became an emperor later, but his name was Titus. He was leading many legions to Jerusalem. And he was, he had laid siege for years to Jerusalem, and then they were able to eventually destroy the walls and kill whoever they could find inside. And then they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and the people that were in it. Jesus was looking forward to that time and the eternal fate of the many people who would not receive him. He was thinking about their children. In 40 years' time, many of them and their children may be alive. The people watching Jesus being beaten and whipped felt so sorry for him. But he was having compassion on them. He was concerned about them. You know, when we watch movies like the Passion of the Christ, or Jesus of Nazareth, or some of those movies. We, the Jesus movie that's being shown in different parts of the world, when we see those, the passion of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus on the cross, and before, when he was whipped and beaten and all that, we feel sorry for him. We feel pity for what he went through. But he may be looking at us. He may be thinking of us, just like he was looking at these people, and feeling compassion for our state for our situation, for our world, for the people that don't know him, for the people that have not made him the Lord of their lives. He's thinking about our eternity. This is just for a moment. What about our eternity that's forever? So what should we do? What about the people that we know that don't know Jesus Christ? Pray. Pray for the people living proudly in sin. Today, we have a lot of people in our city, in our country, proudly living in sin, proud of sin. In Fanny Crosby's song, Rescue the Perishing, for some reason I just went over that song, and in that song, there are words that says, weep for the erring ones, rescue the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. A woman wrote around 20,000 songs. She was blind. But she wrote, weep 
for the erring ones. Weep for the ones that have gone away from God, that are walking along a path that is wrong before God. Weep for them. Rescue them. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. In the world, there is a special thrill that people have to disobey God. There's a special pride that people often take when they know that they're disobeying God. In the book of Philippians, in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, Paul talked about that and he said, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. So Paul's reaction when he saw people that were enemies of the cross was to pray for them, to cry with tears for them. Don't sit idly by if your family or your friend, or someone that you know is walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ. When we see someone who once knew the Lord, living in sin, walking away from God, it may be our child, it may be our parent, it may be our brother or sister, it may be our friend. When we see that happening, don't get angry. Don't get bitter. Don't get, don't get uh, argumentative with them. Weep over their lives. Cry to the Lord about their lives. And as we ache before the Lord, as we sit before Him and cry to the Lord, what, what happens is God hears us. Pray aloud. I remember a time when my mother would pray aloud for me. She would open the door to her bedroom, and I'd be walking down the hallway, but I'd hear her say, Touch my son, oh God! Touch him, Lord! He's walking in pride. He doesn't want to listen. I remember that time. And I believe that that had something to do with me coming to know Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to let out what you need to let out before the Lord. Don't be afraid to hold it back. Let them know. I remember one preacher saying that his grandmother prayed for him. And this might be a little extreme, but he would, she would pray out loud like that. And she would say, Lord, don't let him go to hell. Kill him before that. Don't let him die go to hell. So I, I'm not saying to do that, but I'm just saying it was just she was so wanting him to know the Lord. She was she was uh, somehow wanting him to some, know Jesus Christ, the Savior. Weep over their lives. Don't let it go. Go to him. Keep on asking him. Perhaps God's mercy will reach them. I remember a story about the Wesleys and Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, and if you open your hymn book, there are a lot of hymns by both of them. Their mother prayed and brought them into the kingdom because of them, her prayers, and they, they later on preached about how their mother prayed them into the kingdom of God. That's why you see the United Methodist Church all over the place. They're the founders. God, Jesus, had compassion for those who hated him. Look at verse 35. The people stood watching, and the rulers, see there's three verses, just look at the middle verse. It says, people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Here we have bloodthirsty people. If you watch, uh, if, you, if you read about uh, the United, uh, the uh, UFC, or uh, if you like to watch a lot of boxing and things like that, you'll see blood. You'll see things happen. These people were really bloodthirsty. They want to see death. They want to see people getting killed. And people, they were, they were hating this Jesus. And they were mocking him. They were mocking a beaten man, abused. And he only did good things for them. But even now, as he's being nailed, to pieces of wood. On a cross, they're feeling no compassion, no ounce of empathy, no sense of sorrow for him in any way. And it says that even the soldiers gave him mixed wine with vinegar in order to mock him, is what it says in this, in this book. Mock him with, and it says that it, it might have been with gall in the Psalms, Psalm 68, verse 22. And the psalmist is prophesying about this happening about a thousand years before it happened. It says, 
They gave me gall for food, and they gave me vinegar for my drink. And it happened with Jesus Christ. They gave him wine mixed with vinegar and gall. But what did Jesus respond with? Jesus forgave these people who hated him. His response was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Think about your loved ones who reject prayer, who reject worship, who don't want to come worship with you. They don't want a relationship with Jesus Christ. If they knew the seriousness of what they were doing, if they understood the love that God has for them, they would never do that. They would never turn away from him. They would never give him their bitter, the gall. They would never give him their gall. So what do we have to do? We have to keep knocking. We have to keep knocking on heaven's door. There's that song, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. We got to keep knocking on heaven's door. In verses 39 to 42, it talks about you look on it with me, how the criminals were hurling insults as well. One of the criminals who hung on the cross next to him was hurling insults at him. They were mocking him. But Jesus did not despair. You might have people in your families that may be mocking you for your Christian walk. There may be people on your block that may be mocking you. They may be looking at you as holy rollers, or they may be looking at you as, why are you going to church Sunday morning? Why can't you go to the party with me Saturday night? Why can't you? Why can't you? Why can't you? But we should never give up. We should never quit. We need to keep praying and asking the Lord. I remember my middle brother, who later on became a Chi Alpha missionary for a while. But uh, before he became a Christian, I remember praying for him. After I, got, after I came to know Christ, I got saved, and I started to pray for my brother, my middle brother, who most of you don't know. And uh, I remember praying and asking God to save him. He would make fun of me. And it was the worst thing because he was my younger brother. I was used to beating him up before that. And so, you know, when he was making fun of me, he would just get me, and, you know, I just want to get him. But, but then I would, I, would, I would remember that I'm a Christian. I need to control myself. And I would pray, and I would ask God to save him. And then after a while of that, I remember seeing him one day when I, his door was partially open. I just walked into his room, and there he was in the corner. He was praying. And then he was embarrassed that I saw him pray. And he got up and he was like, what, what, no. You know, he acted like, you know, he wasn't praying. And now he's a preacher. He's a pastor in Canada right now. So keep knocking on heaven's door. Keep knocking on God's door, and God will do things. In your family, in your friends' lives, never give up. Never quit. We only have a small part of his pain. We are only sharing a tiny portion of his burden for the world. Sincere, consistent prayer changes the lives of people. Because God intervenes. There's a story I'm going to read to you. It's a little bit of a long story, but I'm just going to ask you to bear with me. Because it's a good story. It's about prayer. It's about the result of prayer. Looking back, I marvel that I am part of the kingdom today. The logical likelihood of a party, peer-dependent, sports-crazy, girls-chasing, 17-year-old finding himself in love with Jesus five years later seems implausible. Yet here I am. I often wonder how God got a hold of my life. For me, there was no dramatic conversion experience, no watershed moment. It was a slow journey, a series of seemingly ordinary decisions, encounters, and choices that were supernaturally guiding me towards today. Deciding to sever ties with the wrong friends and go to Christian University, to go on a missions trip, to date a Christian girl, to start reading my Bible. They were all miracles in and of themselves. How could a heart so bored with God, so selfish, so cold, so skeptical of the Bible, so anti-youth group, be touched and turned? Well, it wasn't a Billy Graham crusade, a Donald Miller book, or anything quite so tangible. In fact, all I can really offer is that it was the prayers of my mother. 
One thing I know for certain is that throughout my growing up years, I was prayed for. Not just token blessings before bed. My mom and dad labored for me in intercession. Prayers of faith that broke into humanity. And I truly believe, truly believe altered the very course of my life. I remember the day it dawned on me. After spending some time with old friends, I found I no longer had much in common with. I was struck with the stark juxtaposition. I realized how different my life could have been. Afterwards, I remember calling up my mom and saying, Mom, I think the only reason I'm here today is because of you and your prayers. It makes no logical sense that the person I once, I was once could become the man I am today. Completely surprised that someone touched. She some humbly suggested that there was probably there were probably a lot of factors that may be true. But there's no doubt in my mind that the consistent and quiet prayer offerings of a single woman were by far the most important. Kevin, prayer works. God hears. God is in death. Believe that he hears us when we pray. The result of compassionate prayer is that God's spirit starts to break through. Look at verse 40 and what happened in verse 40. But the, criminal, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. Jesus was having compassion. Okay? And what happened? Number one, hearts are broken. Verse 41. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. There's a recognition that this criminal on the cross had of his sin. And of righteousness. Jesus is righteous. He did nothing wrong. But I am a sinner. That's the number one thing that happens. Hearts are broken before God. Number two. Hearts open up before God. Verse 42. Look at that. It says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Desire for a relationship. Desire to know God. Desire to be with God's people. Remember me, Lord. In your kingdom. I want to be with you. I want to be with your people, Lord. If you say that you love God, if we say that we love God, but not God's people, if we hold grudges against God's people, if we are dancing God's people, then remember that you and I are part of God's kingdom. You will answer, and I will answer to the king one day for our thoughts and our behaviors. Remember who we are. Number three, entrance into the kingdom. Look at verse 43. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So lives are changed. And they become a part of the family of God. Lives are transformed. And we have entrance into the presence of God one day when Jesus returns. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God. What are we? A chosen people. Say it with me. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Say it again. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God. And that's that we may declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. Amen? Amen. Wake up, everybody. Wake up. All this happens when God starts to break through the compassionate prayer. When God starts to come in and work, that's what happens. We're left with a promise. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. And I have it in two versions for you. I want you to read it with me and take it with you. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. In more simple terms, in the New Living Translation it says, though, read that with me, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seeds, but they sing as they return with the harvest. There is a harvest for us, people of God. There's a harvest that God wants for us. If we're willing to go sow in tears, it might be some of our children that are burning in our hearts, that are burdened for us every day. It might be some of our family members that burden us 
And we know that they're lost. But God wants us to just sow in tears. Sow in tears into their lives. Speak to them. I pray for them. Ask the Lord to touch them. Tell them, tell them about what God can do in their lives if we're willing. They are meant to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people to God. That they may declare the praises of God. He called them also out of darkness. He called us out of darkness in his marvelous light, his wonderful light. That's what God is calling them to. Those who plant in tears, if we're willing to do that, we will reap the shouts of joy. I say to you, continue to weep before the Lord. He is listening.